The Tsar and His People Apart from A People's Tragedy, The Russian Revolution, 1891-1924 to On a wet and windy morning in February 1913, St. Petersburg celebrated 300 years of Romanov rule over Russia. People had been talking about the great event for weeks. Everyone agreed that nothing quite so splendid would be ever seen again in their lifetimes, and they were right. The majestic power of the dynasty would be displayed as never before in extravagance of pageantry. As the jubilee approached, dignitaries from far-flung parts of the Russian Empire filled the capital's grand hotels. Princes from Poland, the Baltic lands, high priests from Georgia, Armenia, mullahs and tribal chiefs from Central Asia, the emir in Bukhara, and the Khan of Kiev. The city bustled with sightseers from provinces and the usual well-dressed promenaders around the western Winter Palace now found themselves outnumbered by the unwashed masses, peasants and workers in their tunics and caps, rag bundled women with handkerchiefs on their heads. Nevesky Prospect experienced the worst traffic jam in its history as trams and horse-drawn carriages, cars and sleighs converged on it. The main streets were decked out in imperial colors of white, blue, and red. Statues were dressed in garlands and ribbons and portraits of the Tsar, stretching back to Mikhail, the founder of the dynasty, hung on the facades and the banks and stores. Above the tram lines were strung chains of colored lights which lit up at night with the words God Save the Tsar or a Romanov double-headed eagle and the dates 1613 to 1913. Out-of-towners, many of whom never seen an electric light, stared up, scratched their heads in wonderment. The columns, arcs, and obelisks in front of it, in front of the Kazan Cathedral stood a white pavilion filled with incense brown blades shriveling in the Russian winter air. The rituals began with a Solomon thanksgiving to the Kazan Cathedral, led by Patriarch of Antioch, who had come from Greece, especially for the occasion. Three Mar- Russian metropolitans, fifty priests from St. Petersburg, the imperial family, had driven out from Winter Palace in open carriages, accompanied by two squadrons, squadrons of His Majesty's own horse guards and Cossack riders in black choftons and red Caucasian caps. It was the first time the Tsar had ridden in public view since the 1905 revolution, and the police were taking no chances. The route was lined up with imperial guards, gorgeously turned out their feather, shakoffs, and scarlet uniforms. Military bands thumped out the national anthems, and soldiers boomed "Ura" as a cavalade passed by. Outside the cathedral, religious processions from various parts of the city had been converging from the early morning, and the vast crowd a forest of crosses, icons, and banners knelt down as the carriages approached. Inside the cathedral stood Russia's ruling class, grand dukes and princes, members of the court, senators, ministers, state, councillors, Duma, parliamentarians, senior civil servants, generals and admirals, provincial governors, city mayors, zemesto leaders, and marshals of the nobility. Hardly a brass without a robe, shining medals or diamond star, and hardly a pair of legs without a sword. Everything sparkled in a candlelight. The silver iconoclasts, the priest bejeweled minarets, and the crystal cross. In the middle of the ceremony, two doves flew down from the darkness and hovered for several moments over the heads of the Tsar and his son, carried away by a religious exaltation. Nicholas interpreted it as a symbol of God's blessing on the house of Romanov.